This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today we have my man, Mr. Tyler Wrights from Bowman Insurance Group in the great state of Pennsylvania. Keystone guy from the Keystone State. Yeah. What's up, Tyler? Glad to be here, guys. I, I hyped you up as best I could, man. I'm no Bruce Buffer, but I do have several jackets that he would wear, I'm sure. That would be sick if your microphone just dropped from the ceiling at the beginning of every episode. Yeah. You know, Bruce Buffer, they actually had to give him rules because he damaged his legs. So he has to, like, it's in his contract now that both of his feet need to be, remain planted in the octagon while he's announcing because he got amped up one time and jumped up and came down and, like, blew out his ACL. <laughs> from announcing just just like he wasn't on the ropes and jumped off he just no just just did a little little hop little hop in the middle of the ring just jumped up and he just just slammed down yeah bruce yeah it's it's he's an interesting guy man but anyhow we're not here to talk about bruce we're here to talk about tyler so tyler give us all sort of the fifty thousand foot overview man of, of sort of who you are how you got in the industry what you're doing now, and then we'll we'll let the uh, chips fall as they may going forward. Yeah, so I uh, for it's amazing when you talk to a lot of people in insurance. Um, it's kind of most of the people. It's like insurance just they kind of fell into it. Um, I, lack of better terms, I guess I was born into it. Um, my grandfather, my mom, my dad, they worked on the carrier side and, and the broker side. And my uncle, he owns an agency up in northern Pennsylvania. So my whole life, I've been kind of surrounded by insurance. Um, so when I was in college, uh, I was a business major. And um, through mutual connections with my my mom, um, she she kind of steered me to look at an internship with Liberty Mutual as an underwriting assistant. Um, so I, I actually ended up going to interning there. And after I was done, I accepted a full-time role pretty quickly. So I started in uh, Liberty Mutual doing underwriting um, for, I believe it's around four years. And then I ended up going on the agency side um, and, and couldn't be more thrilled. Hmm. So that's interesting. So what did you pick up from the underwriting experience? Um, it, it's, it, I think everybody in insurance should re- like, if you're whether carrier or agency side, everyone should have a, almost do some kind of stint on either side to take a whole new pr- perspective of, you know, how can you find common grounds with who you're working with? Um, from me, when, when I was an underwriter, um, there were things that I took for granted. For example, when a, when an agent walks in with a large account, um, that that really is essentially that agent's baby. I mean, they've 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 coddled that for three to four years, possibly. Um, and you know, it was more of a way. Like, I felt like I would have done a better job at being like, how can we do this? I may not be able to do exactly what you're looking for, but how can I at least position you to be successful? Um, same thing on the agency side. Um, there, there's checks and balances that underwriters got to go through. There's managers they got to answer to. You know, you may not like a decision from an underwriter, but you, you need to learn and understand. You can tell where it's coming from. 
so you know harbor those relationships and um it's uh it was definitely a, a great great perspective to take on both sides nice <clears throat> so i am going to say something unpopular but it goes back to kind of where I came from in working through the different departments in a grocery store. I really feel like if you're going to be the most, let's just say you, you don't know what you want to do in the insurance industry, or even if you want to be a producer, I think you should have to sit as a producer. You should have to sit in the claims desk. You should have to sit in an underwriting desk and you should have to sit in an account manager slash CSR desk at a bare minimum. Right just so that you have a foundational understanding of those people you're going to be working with the most, right? How many right. adversarial relationships do we see with underwriting, with claims, or even the infighting with your own service staff in an agency because of the general lack of respect, which I think is a translation of just an, a lack of understanding of exactly what those people have to do on a daily basis. Also, I think that if you're going to progress and become a partner or have equity in an agency or whatever else, that we should go ahead and, and have those conversations and the dialogue around that so that producers can become groomed to move into that role when the time's right. And I think that too many people who sit in my chair do a bad job of, of talking through operational issues and things like that that a producer who will eventually be an agency principal will have to understand down the road. Why not train them now? Why not teach them now? Why not use every single example that comes into the agency as an opportunity to train and teach your staff? And I think that's one of the biggest issues that our industry faces is we're so concerned about top line revenue that if somebody wants to sell, we're going to bring them in we might throw a little money at them as a draw or whatever else, but we're just going to turn them loose, hoping they're going to go out and figure it out. Like there's very few, you know, many agencies out there have no formal sales process. They have no training program or any of that, but there's also nothing to make your producers well-rounded and understanding. I mean, I've got to believe that if you had a producer that worked claims for six months to a year, underwriting for six months to a year and an account manager's role six months to a year, get them a CIC and a CRM at that point. And they're going to be absolutely deadly and they'll write enough, enough business one year out of the box from going through that process to make up for all the years they would be floundering trying to figure it out. I have to believe that. So, yeah. you know, I wish I would have had that perspective I, because I think that if you're a good producer you draw off of your life experiences, whatever they are. So it's easy right. for me to talk about operational things because I have had PL responsibility historically. It's easy for me to talk about marketing things because I have a degree in marketing. But the only thing, the only reason I'm able to talk about underwriting or claims or even account servicing at this point is just because I've dealt with it for the last 20 years. I couldn't do that the first time I went and sat down in front of a client. And it would right. be a lot more powerful if you were to sit down in front of a client having worked a claims desk and they slide loss runs across to you and say, what would you do? Or what do you think of these claims that are still open? I've been fighting this battle for a year and a half for you to actually have an educated answer for them instead of doing what most producers say, which is, oh, this is ridiculous. I'd have had this closed out nine months ago. Let me, let me get to work on it for you and we'll get you a positive result, right? Right. They have no clue that they can get them a positive result or not. They just know that that's a, a wedge that they've driven. It's temporary, man. If, you, if you're building your foundation <laughs> on a house of sand like that, it's just going to collapse in the long run. I just think we need to do a better job. I think, that, I think that even in the middle market, we see this. The producer's job is an entry-level position, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like how many people graduate to that? How many people get promoted to that? I, yeah. I know there's some old school agencies out there that are more like main street, personal lines, heavy shops. And you do go in and start as an account manager and they'll promote you to being a salesperson or producer. But I'm talking about going out, knocking on doors. Kyle, did you have to work any other job at Florida risk partners before I turned you loose to go out and start cold calling? 
No, man. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. For, like first week, I think I was just I, I, first week. I like walked around the the complex there and was just <laughs> just going out and talking to people. Didn't know what exactly. I was talking about, but I was but, just going out and talking to them. Right. And, and I'm saying that because I'm equally as guilty. <laughs> I don't want people thinking I'm throwing. I'm, I'm casting stones. We're just not patient, man. We don't want to make the investment. We want to get the return before we've made the investment. We want to pay somebody as little as possible to go out and be the face of our organization to the general public and hope that they can somehow convince them with no technical knowledge whatsoever that they are the right solution for their company and ultimately get hired. And the sad part is it works sometimes, right? It actually right. works, which is why we're right. not trying to reinvent it. But I got to believe, I've just got to believe that if we took the time and invested in our production staff the way that we should, we wouldn't be looking for people to validate in year one. We'd be looking for people to validate in year three or four. Right. And understanding along the way that they're doing other activities in the agency so they can learn, even though they're not revenue bearing, they're equally as important. I completely agree. And it's, I mean, it, it's given me um, the opportunity to build relationships with underwriters where if I have if I have a problem account where someone's in a tough spot, um, but there's a good story to tell behind it. And I know what the, the checks and balances that my underwriter is going to go through when I pick up the phone. And, and it's one in particular that um, she and I hit on all cylinders um she trusts me i trust her that if i bring something with good reason behind the this basically the story behind what's going on um i know they're going to come through for me and, and help that person out whereas um other companies won't i mean i i have one in particular a guy had two uh fires at his location um nobody wanted to write him and he was concerned about being out of business um he and we ended up it believe it or not it took us two days from from the time that we got involved i went up there saw him um saw the operations saw what what he was doing to combat the issues that underwriting was having for all these other agencies um got on the phone called my underwriter um and they we got him we got him insured within 48 hours of when we were notified of, of the problems so it's it, was he what was he blowing glass in a wicker cabinet factory or something? Like, no, he he was a he's a very large auto body shop. Um, Ooh, they they were having they they had two fires. Um, one was an electrical issue, and another one was I can't even to be honest I can't remember what the other issue was. I think it was with a waste oil furnace or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and he invested not only were the buildings rebuilt new there i think the fires were in two separate buildings the buildings were rebuilt new he invested 40 or 50 thousand dollars into these these cameras um that within a second of the smoke being um ignited it, it alerts the fire departments and all that it was, it was a great wow. story the guy is awesome um he, he's he's one of the nicest guys and i'm glad we can help him out there you go and, and but the relationship was built with the underwriter and she came through and it's been a great account for them ever since. So how did you, like, what did you represent to them? You were going to do to help prevent fires moving forward. Um, it, it was really, I was digging into what he was doing. I mean, I don't know what um, these other companies were being told by the agency. It was more like, Hey, we need a quote, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm assuming we got involved last minute. Um, Obviously, you know, there's carriers that are blocked, so you can't work with them. Um, we This one carrier is, is um, very limited on how many shops they're in. And I got all the documentation. He gave me all of the testing that they are doing, all of the, um, all the diagrams of the new buildings, what, what uh, systems that are being installed, how it's, what he's been doing with the local fire department and all that. Um, that was the hold on a mess. second, man. I mean, you actually asked questions to develop a, a fact pattern and created yeah. a story that you then yeah. relayed to an underwriter to help your client get coverage. What yeah. a novel concept. Yeah, <laughs> I know. 
it's uh it's it's something i think um is missed a lot where uh maybe in, in a lot of the agencies now they're pushing to they just want to get business on the books they miss the the details that need to be relayed to underwriters to make it a attractive risk to somebody but then also what can you what can they do to help to be more make their clients more attractive to underwriters yeah you know i i think that putting together an effective narrative is a little bit of an art okay i mean i would put my submissions like when i sit down on a middle market account and do a full blown submission and by the way people I don't do it 100% of the time. So before you start, you know, throwing rocks at me, sometimes you need to, sometimes you don't, right? If I've got an account that's clean that we've represented for five years, I don't need to do a narrative for the renewal. But right. if I'm going in and working with somebody that's new, you know, it's this is not about you trying to spin the situation, right? Like an underwriter is going to sniff it out. And if you're trying to spin it just to get them to write it, the loss control people are going to shut you down faster than you know what happened to you when they go to inspect it. But, you know, I, I had an account several years ago that I wrote that was in an old furniture warehouse slash man manufacturing facility. It was a manufacturer. The equipment was way too big for the space that had been allocated to it on each of the floors there were multiple floors in this building the mod was almost a 2.0 it was it was just below a 2.0 and when you go in and you start asking questions and you take like i took pictures and video and everything else but it was really obvious that there was inherent danger just in the way that it was set up now this account in the next three months moved to a brand new facility that they had designed specifically for them. It was a couple hundred thousand square feet, but they, they were in control of the entire build out and everything. And guess what? There were no claims for like the next three or four years, nothing. Hmm. It was a hundred percent because of the configuration of the equipment. And more importantly, they had some stupid claims because they didn't have the right processes and the right accountability measures in place. If you're a producer and you're listening to what I'm saying right now, you need to pay attention to this. Okay. You have to tell the truth. If your prospect is, has gotten, had claims because they did stupid stuff, acknowledge that. Acknowledge, look, this claim shouldn't have happened. This claim shouldn't have happened. This claim shouldn't have happened. These are the programs we have already put in place. These are the programs we're projecting to put in place that will solve the stupid stuff. Here are some issues that were just in general a problem based on the fact that it was a building that was too small for this type of operation. And the company grew incredibly fast and they couldn't relocate fast enough. So this is what we think is going to be solved by this. Then that was enough to get them interested. But I then asked, we would really appreciate it if you were willing to send a loss control rep out to the new facility and take a tour of the property with us to see if there's anything at all you would want us to do differently as the insurer who is going to write this, right? You have to disclose it 100%. I think we get I think we get weird when there's hair on an account, right? The reason right. I get success with underwriters is because I tell them that I know the hair is there. Right. I, I fix it, right? I'm the barber. Exactly. Hey, well, it's also too, I mean, like my takeaway from all of that is you wouldn't have uncovered that these issues were a result of the machinery being too big and the space being too small. If you hadn't actually gone out and <laughs> looked at the space, like, you can't gather that information sometimes from looking at loss runs. I mean, of course you can see trends and okay, there's been three claims where somebody has, you know, done something similar. Okay. But you're not going to figure out like exactly why that's happening unless you go and, and do the work yourself and get out there and, and, and get active. So I, I think that part may have gotten lost in translation there, but that that's a really key point that you made. Yeah, you know, the other thing, too, is I've gotten to the point now where a lot of the times, and I, I did this with the big construction company that we brought on at the first of the year, 
Um, mm. Now, granted, that thing was a couple million dollars in premium. So anybody's going to take the time to sit sure. down and try and, and, and handle that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I put together a video narrative for them. I, I wanted them to not only get the written word of what we understood the operations to be the issues that they had. And this, they didn't have a ton of issues on this account. They just had lack of processes, which we needed to firm up for them, um, which we had to acknowledge because they didn't have them. And so I actually took the time to, I, I opened it up with my narrative verbally on video. And then Nicole in our office, did a screen uh, screen record walking through the risk management center that we built for this client so that we could show them how we were tracking the certificates of subcontractors, how we were tracking job site safety, the learning management system that we put in place for these people, the HR protocols and, and all of that. And we just walked it right down the line. And it was about a 15 minute video. Guess what? I don't know who they handed that thing off to inside the carriers, but HubSpot tells me every time an email is opened and Vimeo tells me every time that video has been watched, that thing's been watched over a hundred times. And I sent it to one person. Well, think it's about how much more powerful that is than just right. sending somebody an email explaining stuff, you know, like, I mean, people are, most people are visual. I know I am. So when I see something, I'm able to retain it more. And it, and it also just shows that you are serious and you're not just kind of giving them lip service. Yeah. I think, um, you know, from my perspective, a lot of people say they're going to do something, but if you show them you've already done it, like there's nothing to argue about at that point. Right. That's, that's a key point is I think putting the rubber on the road is if you don't, if you acknowledge it up front, I think you, and then how you're going to address it, I think you buy a lot more trust from your underwriter than if you go out, they, they go out, they do an inspection, you're not there, they uncover all these other issues that you didn't bring up front to, to address with them. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, what else? Was there something missed? What else do I need to be concerned about? Um, I, I think you're spot on. So talk about your, your book, your agency a little bit. I mean, are you, are you a specialist? Do you have niches that you go after specifically? Are you more of a generalist? What's that look like? I'm, I'm more of a generalist now. Do I have some industries that I do very well in? Um, absolutely, where it's just kind of um, by association and working on referrals. I've, municipalities uh, has been a big, big program for us. Um, and all of Keystone. And then I do, I do a lot in fuel dealers. Um, it's, it's been, it's been great to work on helping them out. Um, but I, I have everything from construction to manufacturing, you name it. I, I pretty much go across the board. Um, our agency is, is, uh, more of a, historically was a small, more of a hometown agency. Uh, the current principal was involved a lot with, um, smaller construction companies or, or just smaller, smaller um, commercial policies to begin with. And then we do uh, personal lines and we have a personalized division. But uh, with my background in underwriting, um, I, my, my focus and where I thought I, I uh, made a, the biggest impact was in targeting larger accounts. Um, and that's where I've been ever since. Any particular line of coverage that you lead with or anything? Um, I, it, it all depends. Um, workers comp can be very problematic. Some of that's where I've written a lot of them where it's, the workers comp has been uh, very problematic for certain companies. Um, but I'll also target um, auto related risks because you, you guys know as well as I do, the auto market has not been um, very favorable to clients here in the past few years. Um, so I'll, I'll target that area as well, too. Cool. So what would you say when you've come over to the production side, what's the biggest surprise that you had after leaving your time at the carrier to come and, and work on your new career as a producer? What, what would you say the biggest surprise was that you encountered? Ooh, that's a good one. I'd probably say 
the amount of work that goes into a submission before you, as an underwriter, you ever see it. Um, from the beginning of targeting a prospect, walking the whole way through, um, working with them to where you get to the opportunity to, to review and work on the risk management and, and insurance policies. And then that just begins of where you move on to now of seeing what carriers are, are a good fit for that client and working in that area. It's, that, was, that was by far probably the biggest surprise to me. So we talked a little bit about, you know, a relationship that you had with an underwriter that resulted in you guys picking up, um, you know, a, a piece of business that was having some trouble getting coverage. Obviously, that was somebody that you had cultivated a relationship with. What kind of advice can you give someone, um, you know, that is maybe newer to the insurance world or, you um, you know, maybe starting to work with some newer carriers and don't necessarily have those relationships, those, um, you know, long-standing or, or sturdy relationships already in place. What kind of advice could you give them to help start building those? I, I think, I think David hit it on, like nailed it when he said, you know, be upfront about it, recognize what they're going to find, whether do and do a little homework upfront. Um, you guys know that carriers look at, whether it's social media, websites, um, but also do a little due diligence and going to see the property. I, I like when I get a, a like a referral call or someone wants to meet with me, most of the times they, they kind of ask you to just step in their office and, and try to look at, I always want to see their property. I want to see their, their operations. I want to see things so that I know entirely what's going on. And um, if, if if somebody new to the production side kind of goes and, and does that and almost is, is I, I guess, being on the forefront of what an underwriter might want to know, um, but addressing things up front, I think the trust will build and you can carry that from then on. Well, here's my thing, man. If you haven't gone and touched and felt the risk, how can you complete right. an insurance application, right? I, right? I mean, if you sit, but it's ludicrous to even think that it happens, but you and I both, I mean, look, I'll be the first person to tell you, have I ever written a building or property that I haven't personally gone and inspected 100% have done that. I would never sit here and try and make everybody think that I'm in this ivory tower and I never do any of this stuff, but you know, that's typically going to be something that's, you know, an hour or more away. That's a smaller piece of business. That's more transactional. You know, they're just calling in, they're just starting in business. They need to get coverage or whatever. We're Very not going to go. Yeah, yeah, we're not going to inspect that stuff, right? There's really no reason to because I also, because the carrier is going to, in most cases, regardless of the size of the account, they're typically going to lose control the account down here. But if it's a middle market account, man, it is amazing to me how many people have never looked at the building or walked and toured the facility while it's running to understand the production process. They've never met the people like any of that. So, and, and I correlate that back to okay. the yes, no questions on accord forms, right? Every agency management system is always set up to default to the correct answer based on what the underwriter wants to hear. <laughs> How many people actually go down that list of questions as a checklist and verify the information, right? How many people on the workers comp know if you have young kids or old people working there, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody ever. No, nope. Nobody over 65 or six. I don't even know what the question is. 60, I think it's 60, 60, 60, yeah, under no, 60. Nobody over 60 and nobody under 16, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Like how many people actually ask that question to their client though? I don't ask right. it a hundred percent of the time. No. But then, then who gets hurt? The sixty-four-year-old right. guy that's you know lifting, out, lifting a fifty lifting a water, yeah, yeah, lifting yeah, exactly. a water heater into the back of a plumbing truck, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that right. guy, he's new. Hernia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's he, he's new. He did, he he wasn't here when I filled out the accord. But I mean, it, it's ludicrous to point things like this out. But it's equally is ludicrous that we accept it, right? That we just right. continue down that road because it's not that difficult. We're just right. I don't know if it's that people don't want to bother their client anymore or whatever else. Okay, fine. Yeah. 
take those questions, build them into the questions you ask on a first appointment and get them answered then. Take your right. notes. Now you have your accord questions answered. And guess what else, people? A lot of people are newer. They don't know what questions to ask. Ask the questions on the accord form. Now you look like you actually do know your job. Right. <laughs> not like It's not like you have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, it's just, it, it blows my mind to your point. Like, again, it, it's not, this one, that's why the title of my first book was the extra two minutes. It doesn't take that much more effort to do it the right way. We just don't want to invest that time. Right. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I saw in the underwriting so, uh, when I was behind the desk, you know, you'd get accord, accord forms sent in. None of the questions were answered. They just had exposures on it. And you got lost from It's like, please give me a quote. And it's like, you're not telling me a story behind what's going on here. Why, why should I, why should I take a risk? Cause really, I mean, underwriters are educated gamblers. That's, mm -hmm. How, how are you like you got a stack of chips in your favor and if you're not telling a story um you're doing your client a disservice yep 100 percent. what's the most ridiculous thing you ever saw when you were on the underwriting side of things i'm gonna be honest the probably the the most ridiculous thing i've seen was actually a broker record situation there was a, there had to be four or five agents. Imagine that, there. man. Imagine oh that. Oh my gosh. Agents I, I, messing with the AOR. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, I, and it was, it was amazing because I was the center of all of it because they would all, they would be calling me and telling me about what this other agency is doing to get this agent a record. And, and it's like, you, we eventually shut down the account because the, the insured just kept signing it over. And it's like, there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, like back, like know. back and forth or what? All over the place. I mean, I got a, I got an Asian record from like three or four agencies. I don't know <laughs> if they, there, there's a big, I, I don't know if he was just thought, I, I have had this happen where an agency, I was working with a client and uh, another agent, he had allowed another agency to come in and um, I get, uh, notified that an agent of record was signed for another agency. I call him, the owner of the business, and I just touch base with him and ask him if he knew what he was signing, you know, the whole nine yards. And he's like, well, no. Um, he told me he just needed this to get a quote. And that is the quickest way to burn a bridge because he immediately did, fired, got, had the other agency leave. Like yeah. he wasn't involved anymore, but, and I don't know, that may have been what was going on there. I have no idea. Um, there was so much back and forth, but it was ridiculous. I, I mean, I've dealt with it where there's two agents going back and forth, but never in my time where I had three or four agencies all getting agent of record letters. I have mm -hmm. no idea what was going on. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I also have to wonder in that scenario, like how culpable is the actual prospect in that process? Right. Right. 100%. Like I, if it's two agents fighting over it, there's maybe a misunderstanding if you've awarded or unless <laughs> it was like different partners. Cause I've seen that before where you right. may have three or four partners and each one has their horse. They want to ride. So they each sign agent of record letters. And I've seen three or four agents get in the mix that way. But you know, I just, you got to wonder like what, what, what are you really doing, man? You know, yeah. I, I had no interest in writing an account. I can be honest. <laughs> Cause right. it's, it was, it was when you make that kind of mess of all those people in there. No, Cause the like, AOR is going to start coming back in again, midterm. Right. 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 Three months so, after you write it, some clown's going to want to AOR it over and then they're going to get upset because they can't get paid on it. Right. Right. So yeah, that was, that was about probably one of the most wild things I've seen. Um, just totally out of the blue. I think it's important though. You know, we haven't really clarified this for a while. I, we used to all the time, but there's a general misconception that the AOR itself is, is shady, right? That, that it's a, a dirty trick that agents use, blah, 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 blah. It also seems like the majority of the time that I see people complaining about the AOR, they came from a captive environment before they were an independent agent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me be very clear. A hammer 
can be used to build a house or to crack somebody's cranium. <laughs> Does the hammer decide what it's going to do? No, the person using it decides what it's going to do. The yeah. AOR is no different. It's an inanimate object. It is emotionless. It has no feelings, nothing. <laughs> it's literally a tool that was designed by insurance companies to allow our clients and prospects to freely choose their representation in the marketplace while maintaining a carrier relationship that they want to keep and that they value. It's really that simple. Here's what I know. And we listen, everybody's formulating their thoughts, right? I understand that there are shady payroll companies that slide AORs into onboarding packets, have you sign it. They have no clue. The prospect client, whatever, has no clue what they're signing. We're going to discount that, okay? That, that part doesn't matter. We understand that, look, there's also a subset of people that walk into a grocery store and shoplift, okay? Right. So it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean everybody's a criminal. It just means that the people who shoplift are the criminal. Same thing holds true with the AOR in that it is literally a tool. That's it. Your client gets freedom of choice and how you present that to them, how it's presented to the underwriters, that determines the ultimate course of action. Agents, listen to me. Aside from the shady payroll companies, there has never been a time in my career where I have seen an AOR get tendered against an agent that was doing their job. Not one time. Right. Not one time. College buddy, doesn't matter. I was in here first. Tell your college buddy I'm going to retire in 10 years. He can have the account when I'm done. But it's never against the people who are actually doing what they say they're going to do. Who is it against? Well, Let's start out with the people that don't ans answer questions on Accord forms or the people that don't take the time to do the narrative on the submission. And as a result, there's an uncovered claim. Now they like the carrier. The carrier explained why it was uncovered and it made all the sense in the world. It was the agent that didn't do their job. Well, the carrier wants to retain that business. So boom, you know, it's never the person who's doing things a hundred percent the right way, because it's very, very difficult for a client to justify firing somebody who's doing their job. Now, right. I'm sure there are examples out there where people have been doing everything they should do, delivering exceptional results, and a relative or a college buddy or whatever else ends up getting into the mix and the account was given away based 100% on that person's relationship with the decision maker. I'm sure that happens. I've just never seen it. And I think that it's safe to say that in the overwhelming majority of the times, that's not what happens, right? right? It's literally, you're not doing your job, man. You don't get beat on price. Right. AOR is not a price play, right? You can't go, oh, right. he had better coverage and better pricing than I did. No, he didn't. No, she didn't. They took your program that you designed and did not execute properly. And they moved it to their agency because you didn't do your job. End of story. Right. That's why people get butt hurt. They don't want to get fired. And who, who does, who wants to stand up and give, you know, give the ex client a high five saying, Hey man, you perfectly executed the use of this inanimate object to fire me and, and provide revenue to another person. Now, no, nobody's going to celebrate it, but if you're objective and you sit back and you look in the mirror, I'm going to guarantee you 99% of the time you're going to figure out, you know what? I should have lost the account. I didn't do this that I said I would do. I didn't do this. And even if you did everything and the results aren't there, you might get one get out of jail free card, but you ain't gonna get two. Yeah, in all reality, it, it, I mean, an insurance is probably close to the big, closest thing to the ultimate slap in the face as, as if as an agent. If I mean, you're essentially fired. Um, but yeah, if you're doing your job, it very. I've never seen it, but every, every agent of record that I've ever taken, it was primarily, well, it was 100% because you will go in, review their program, review what's going on, and you lay out the facts of what's not being done or not being serviced here, where the problems are, and you just lay it out and say, hey, you're, in the be you're with the best carrier for, for what you're doing. You're just with the wrong agency. Here's, here's what this does. Explain the whole process, and it's smooth for you. Um, but you're you're completely right
So you yep. came from the producer background, you know, mentioned that you were sliding into the partnership role and, you know, eventually plans have taken over the agency. What's, what's that been like? Um, it's, it's been a learning experience to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole different dynamic. Whereas I'm in the past, I was only focused on my book and doing what I needed to do for my clients. Now there's a whole other aspect of now you got all the different things of employees, all the administrative that comes with running an agency that takes up a lot of time. Um, it, there's a lot more moving parts. So that's, that's sure. been the big, biggest learning curve for me. What about like coworkers are now employees? Um, that is, that is definitely another area too, whereas, you know, it's a different, you, you all of a sudden flip a switch to where now you're, you're kind of going to be leading, you know, the, the agency moving forward. It, it is, it's a different, different dynamic to take. There's no doubt about it. I think part of it too, though, your, your ability to make that, um, make that move is predicated on how well current leadership has paved the way for you and set the table. Right. Right. Like 100%. if you're being groomed to take, look, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, my oldest son's here at the agency and the number one thing that most people are going to say is, Oh, taking over the shop when dad's ready to retire. And I'm the first person to say, no, absolutely not. Kyle was here first. And I have no problem, you know, if I'm ready to take a less active role in the agency, having Kyle come in and assume that role. I've been very clear with my son about that. And he's a level headed enough dude that he gets it and he understands it. Now, at some point, that's going to happen. At some point, Grayson's going to be ready to take the reins, but it's going to be after Kyle's had his chance, you know, and I, I think that we need to do a good job as agency principals. If we know what our exit strategy is, if we know what the, when we hit the glide path, we need to do everything we can to set our successor up for success, period. That's incumbent on us. And if you do it right, you shouldn't have any issues when you take the agency over. You shouldn't have right. any issues with coworkers at all. They will have all been fleshed out long before that happened. But you're talking about a process that's maybe one, two, maybe even three years of that agency principal knowing this is what's getting ready to happen. You know, I don't know if you know Josh Gurley, who's in Keystone or not. He's a good friend of mine, certainly been on the on the podcast a number of times. His agency's down in Georgia. Him and Andrew Deering are there I think at they were at a I think they were at the emerging leaders uh, for Keystone has an emerging leaders um, like conference. And I think they were down there uh, when I was down there. Which one were you at? The one in Orlando? Orlando. I was in Orlando two years in a row. Yeah. I was the keynote at the one in Vegas. So I knew you weren't okay. there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I didn't get to go. I didn't get to go to the Vegas one. I, I, there's just too much going on. I just yeah. No, 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 no. But those guys, you know, Andrew's father-in-law, Waylon owns the agency or owned it. And they were, you know, kind of in limbo for a couple of years. And, you know, things get a little frustrating when you don't know what's going on. And, you know, it was like all of a sudden one day Waylon said, you know what, I'm done. I'm ready to go enjoy the rest of my life. Let's go ahead and put together an agreement, get some paperwork signed. You guys are ready to rock and roll. And it came out of nowhere. And ever <laughs> yeah. since, ever since it's happened, all of the incremental steps have been taken to make sure that that transition is as smooth as possible. And, you know, Josh and Andrew want it to be smooth. And, and so does Waylon. You know, some of those people, they've been working there for 20 plus years. It's going to be a big deal. You know, when you have people that have been at a company that long and that person, those people have been there longer than the person who's going to take over. There's some natural animosity there, whether or not they're qualified to take that role or not. It's like, well, you know, I've been here for five years longer than him. Why is he, why does he have the keys to the building or why, why is she sitting in the boss's office now? I, I think we, we can do a, a good job of setting people up for success. And I, again, it goes, everything in our roles boils down to one thing. 
and one thing only that's communication period Mm -hmm. right we got to communicate with our team we have to be willing to allow our team to communicate with us we have to communicate with claims we have to communicate with underwriters all of the things we've talked about involve communication communication is not hard you know i think some people are a little bit averse to asking tougher questions I've never really had a problem with it. I just f- have found that you just ask the question. I, you know, I'm not trying to fl- uh, sugarcoat anything and make it flowery or whatever. Well, else. I think it, it it requires people to be uncomfortable sometimes, and that's where the hesitancy comes in. If they can just avoid a you know confrontational situation or maybe something that's a little bit awkward for them, a lot of times people do that, and that's when the communication breaks down. Um, I, I mean, and, and that goes for everybody's personal life too. I see it all the time. Um, but I, I think that's an important thing, man. The communication has got to be there and it's, and it's got to be clear. Yep. I agree. So I got to know, man, do you have a list? Like, do you have a list of all the things that you've been dreaming about that you would be able to accomplish one day when you took the agency over and you don't even need to divulge it just a yes or no is good. But yeah, I, I mean, mean, I can, I can tell you my entire agency is founded on all of the stuff I was never allowed to do anywhere else. Right. Like yeah, I the, worked- 100%. I mean, they're, 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 I think anybody taking over an agency wouldn't, wouldn't like to make definite changes in certain areas from the way things were done. I mean, that's the whole, I mean, I feel like that's the reason why you strive to want to take over an agency because you want to, you know, improve upon it. And that's my goal is, is we've been in business for, I think it's 114 years or something like that. And wow. I just, I just want to improve upon what's been built by, in the past by previous predecessors and employees and, and um, make it even better. Nice. What have we not touched on? I can't think of anything, man. I think, I mean, I think we've done a good job of kicking the can all the way around. I can tell you, like, I will tell you my first two things that that I wanted to do. Number one, have an account. And number two, have a a CRM. That was it. Like, it was that simple. (laughs) To have, to have an accountant and have a CRM is that yeah, what have somebody have somebody that was a qualified accountant that actually understood bookkeeping in an insurance agency so that all of that stuff was taken care of and I wanted to have a CRM so that I could organize the sales process and keep our lead stat in a consolidated area that's it I mean there were a lot of other smaller things but those were the two big ones I mean that's one of the first questions I asked you not the accountant part yeah, but, but the CRM piece CRM absolutely. yeah it's like, you know, what do you got in place for that? So makes 100%. sense. Well, listen, Tyler, I'm going to be, be um, cognizant of the fact you've been generous with your time today. I think it's cool. We go ahead and wrap this thing up. We have, you're, you're in the middle of a long string of Keystone agents that have been yep. on the podcast. Um, yep. So I would say probably like three, four weeks out is when this thing will drop. Oh, no. Appreciate it, guys. I'm glad cool. we could be on. I'm sure you'll enjoy the rest of them. That's for sure. Absolutely. We've had a blast so far, man. It's been fun. So everybody else, thanks for tuning in. We will catch you next time. See ya. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, Killing